Disc 5. Today I have much to do, Hercule Poirot announced as he rose from the breakfast table next morning and joined Miss Lemon. Inquiries to make. You have made the necessary researches for me, the appointments, the necessary contacts? Certainly, said Miss Lemon. It's all here. She handed him a small briefcase. Poirot took a quick glance at its contents and nodded his head. I can always rely on you, Miss Lemon, he said. C'est fantastique. Oh, really, Monsieur Poirot, I can't see anything fantastic about it. You gave me instructions, and I carried them out, naturally. Pah, it is not so natural as that, said Poirot. Do I not give instructions often to the gas men, the electricians, the man who comes to repair things, and do they always carry out my instructions? Very, very seldom. He went into the hall. My slightly heavier overcoat, George, I think the autumn chill is setting in. He popped his head back in his secretary's room. By the way, what do you think of that young woman who came yesterday? Miss Lemon, arrested as she was about to plunge her fingers onto the typewriter, said briefly, Foreign. Yes, yes. Obviously foreign. You do not think anything more about her than that? Miss Lemon considered. I had no means of judging her capability in any way, she added rather doubtfully. She seemed upset about something. Yes, she is suspected, you see, of stealing, not money, but papers from her employer. Dear, dear, said Miss Lemon. Important papers? It seems highly probable. It is equally probable, though, that he has not lost anything at all. Oh, well, said Miss Lemon giving her employer a special look that she always gave, and which announced that she wished to get rid of him so that she could get on with proper fervour with her work. Well, I always say that it's better to know where you are when you are employing someone and buy British. Hercule Poirot went out. His first visit was to Borodine Mansions. He took a taxi. Alighting at the courtyard, he cast his eyes around— a uniformed porter was standing in one of the doorways, whistling a somewhat doleful melody. As Poirot advanced upon him, he said, "'Yes, sir?' "'I wondered,' said Poirot, "'if you can tell me anything about a very sad occurrence that took place here recently.' "'Sad occurrence?' said the porter. "'Or oh, nothing that I know of.' "'A lady who threw herself, or shall we say fell, from one of the upper stories, and was killed.' "'Oh, that!' <laughs> I don't know anything about that, because I've only been here a week, you see. Hi, Joe. A porter emerging from the opposite side of the block came over. Oh, you'd know about the lady as far from the seventh. About a month ago, wasn't it? Oh, not quite as much as that, said Joe. He was an elderly, slow-speaking man. Nasty business it was. She was killed instantly? Yeah. What was her name? It may, you understand, have been a relative of mine, Poirot explained. He was not a man who had any scruples about departing from the truth. Oh, indeed, sir. Very sorry to hear it. She was a Mrs. Charpentier. She had been in the flat to some time? Well, uh, let me see now. Uh, about a year. A year and a half, perhaps. No, I think it must have been about two years. Number 76, seventh floor. Uh, that is uh, the top floor? Yes, sir. A Mrs. Charpentier. Poirot did not press for any other descriptive information, since he might be presumed to know such things about his own relative. Instead, he asked, Did it cause much excitement, uh, much questioning? What time of day was it? Five or six in the morning, I think. No warning or anything. Just down she came. In spite of being so early, we got a crowd almost at once, pushing through the railing over there. You know what people are. And the police, of course. Oh, yeah. The police came quickly. And a doctor and an ambulance. All the usual, said the porter, rather in the weary tone of one who had had people throwing themselves out of a seventh-story window once or twice every month. And I suppose people came down from the flats uh, when they heard what had happened? Oh, there wasn't so many coming from the flats, because, for one thing, with the noise of traffic and uh, everything around here, most of them didn't know about it. Someone or other said she gave a bit of a scream as she came down but not so that it caused any real commotion. It was only people in the street passing by who saw it happen. And then, of course, uh, they craned their necks over the railings, and other people saw them craning and joined them. You know what an accident is. Poirot assured him he knew what an accident was. She lived alone, 
he said, making it only half a question. That's right. But she had friends, I suppose, among the other flat-dwellers. Joe shrugged and shook his head. May have done. I couldn't say. Never saw her in the restaurant much, with any of our lot. She had outside friends to dinner here sometimes. No, I wouldn't say she was specially pally with anybody here. You'd do best, said Joe, getting slightly restive, to go and have a chat with Mr. McFarlane, who's in charge here, if you want to know about her. Ah, I thank you. Yes, that is what I mean to do. His office is in that block over there, sir, on the ground floor. You'll see it marked up on the door. Poirot went as directed. He detached from his briefcase the top letter with which Miss Lemon had supplied him, and which was marked Mr. McFarlane. Mr. McFarlane turned out to be a good-looking, shrewd-looking man of about forty-five. Poirot handed him the letter. He opened and read it. "'Ah, oh, yes,' he said. "'I see.' He laid it down on the desk and looked at Poirot. "'The owners have instructed me to give you all the help I can about the sad death of Mrs. Louise Charpentier. Now, what do you want to know exactly, monsieur?' He glanced at the letter. "'Monsieur Poirot?' "'This is, of course, all quite confidential.' said Poirot. Her relatives have been communicated with by the police and by a solicitor, but they were anxious, as I was coming to England, that I should get a few more personal facts, if you understand me. It is distressing when one can only get official reports. Yes, quite so, yes, I quite understand that it must be. Well, I'll tell you everything I can. How long had she been here, and how did she come to take the flat? She'd been here... Oh, I can look it up exactly... About two years. Uh, there was a vacant tenancy, and I imagine that the lady who was leaving, being an acquaintance of hers, told her in advance that she was giving it up. Uh, that was a Mrs. Wilder, worked for the BBC, had been in London for some time, but was going to Canada. Very nice lady. I don't think she knew the deceased well at all, just happened to mention that she was giving up the flat. Mrs. Charpentier liked the flat. You found her a suitable tenant? There was a very faint hesitation before Mr. McFarlane answered. Uh, she was a satisfactory tenant, yes. You need not mind telling me, said Hercule Poirot. There were wild parties, eh? a little too, uh, shall we say, gay in her entertaining? Mr. McFarlane stopped being so discreet. Uh, there were a few complaints from time to time, but mostly from elderly people. Hercule Poirot made a significant gesture. Uh, a bit too fond of the bottle, sir, and uh, in with quite a gay lot. It made for a bit of trouble uh, now and again. And she was fond of the gentleman. Well, uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. No, no, but uh, one understands. Of course, uh, she wasn't so young. Appearances are very often deceptive. How old would you have said she was? Well, it's difficult to say. Forty, forty-five, he added. Her health wasn't good, you know. So I understand. She drank too much, no doubt about it. And then she'd get very depressed, nervous about herself, always going to doctors, I believe, and not believing what they told her. Ladies do get it into their heads, especially about that time of life. She thought she had cancer. Was quite sure of it. The doctor reassured her, but she didn't believe him. He said at the inquest that there was really nothing wrong with her. Oh, well, one hears of things like that every day. She got all worked up, and one fine day, he nodded. It is very sad, said Poirot. Did she have any special friends among the residents of the flats? Well, not that I know of. This place, you see, isn't what I call the matey kind. They're mostly people in business, sir, in jobs. I was thinking possibly of Miss Claudia Rees Holland. I wondered if they had known each other. Miss Rees Holland? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, I mean, there were probably acquaintances. Talked when they went up in the lift together, that sort of thing. But I don't think there was much social contact of any kind. You see, they would be in a different generation. I mean, Mr. McFarlane seemed a little flustered. Poirot wondered why. He said, One of the other girls who share Miss Holland's flat uh, knew Mrs. Charpentier, I believe, Miss Norma Resteric. Did she? I wouldn't know. She only came here quite recently. I hardly know her by sight. Rather a frightened-looking young lady. Not long out of school, I'd say. He added, Is there anything more I can do for you, sir? Uh, no, thank you. You have been most kind. I wonder if possibly I could see the flat. Just in order to be able to say... Poirot paused, not particularizing what he wanted to be able to say. 
Uh, well, now, let me see. Uh, Mr. Travis has got it now. He's in the city all day. Uh, yes, uh, come up with me if you like, sir. They went up to the seventh floor. As Mr. Macfarlane introduced his key, one of the numbers fell from the door and narrowly avoided Poirot's patent leather shoe. He hopped nimbly and then bent to pick it up. He replaced the spike, which fixed it on the door very carefully. "'These numbers are loose,' he said. Oh, "'I'm very sorry, sir. I'll make a note of it. Yes, they wear loose from time to time. Well, here we are.' Poirot went into the living room. At the moment it had little personality. The walls were papered with a paper resembling grained wood. It had conventional, comfortable furniture. The only personal touch was a television set and a certain number of books. "'All the flats are partly furnished, you see,' said Mr. Macfarlane. "'The tenants don't need to bring anything of their own unless they want to. We cater very largely for people who come and go.' "'And the decorations are all the same?' "'Oh, not entirely. People seem to like this raw wood effect. Good background for pictures. The only things that are different are on the wall facing the door.' We have a whole set of frescoes which people can choose from. We have a set of ten, said Mr. Macfarlane with some pride. There is the Japanese one, very artistic, don't you think? And there is uh, an English garden one, a very striking one of birds, one of trees, a harlequin one, a rather interesting abstract effect, lines and cubes in vividly contrasting colours, that sort of thing. They're all designs by good artists. Our furniture is all the same, two choices of colours, or, of course, people can add what they like of their own but they don't usually bother. Most of them are not, as you might say, homemakers, Poirot suggested. No, rather the bird-of-passage type, or busy people who want solid comfort, good plumbing and all that, but aren't particularly interested in decoration. Though we've had one or two of the do-it-yourself type, which isn't really satisfactory from our point of view. We've had to put a clause in the lease, saying they've got to put things back as they found them, or pay for that being done. They seem to be getting rather far away from the subject of Mrs. Charpentier's death, Poirot approached the window. "'It was from here?' he murmured delicately. Oh, "'Yes, that's the window, the left-hand one. It has a balcony.' Poirot looked out down below. Seven floors,' he said. "'A long way.' "'Yes, uh, death was instantaneous, I'm glad to say. Of course, it might have been an accident.' Poirot shook his head. "'You cannot seriously suggest that, Mr. Macfarlane. It must have been deliberate.' "'Well, one always likes to suggest an easier possibility. "'She wasn't a happy woman, I'm afraid.' "'Thank you,' said Poirot, "'for your great courtesy. "'I shall be able to give her relations in France a very clear picture.' "'His own picture of what had occurred was not as clear as he would have liked. "'So far there had been nothing to support his theory "'that the death of Louise Charpentier had been important. "'He repeated the Christian name thoughtfully. "'Louise.' Why had the name Louise some haunting memory about it? He shook his head. He thanked Mr. Macfarlane and left. Chief Inspector Neal was sitting behind his desk looking very official and formal. He greeted Poirot politely and motioned him to a chair. As soon as the young man who had introduced Poirot to the presence had left, Chief Inspector Neal's manner changed. And what are you after now, you secretive old devil? he said. As to that, said Poirot, you already know. Oh, yes. I've rustled up some stuff, but uh, I don't think there's much for you in that particular hole. Why call it a hole? Because you're so exactly like a good mouser. A cat sitting over a hole, waiting for the mouse to come out. Well, if you ask me, there isn't any mouse in this particular hole. Mind you, I don't say that you couldn't unearth some dubious transactions. You know these financiers... I dare say there's a lot of hokey-pokey business and all that about minerals and concessions and oil and all those things, but Joshua Resteric Limited has got a good reputation. Family business, or used to be. But you can't say it's that now. Simon Resteric hadn't any children, and his brother Andrew Resteric only has this daughter. There was an old aunt on the mother's side. Andrew Resteric's daughter lived with her after she left school and her own mother died. The aunt died of a stroke about six months ago, mildly potty, I believe, belonged to a few rather peculiar religious societies. No harm in them. Simon Resteric was a perfectly plain type of shrewd businessman and had a social wife. They were married rather late in life. And Andrew? 
Andrew seems to have suffered from wanderlust. Nothing known against him. Never stayed anywhere long. Wandered about South Africa, South America, Kenya, and a good many other places. His brother pressed him to come back more than once, but he wasn't having any. He didn't like London or business. But he seems to have had the Risteric family flair for making money. He went after mineral deposits, things like that. He wasn't an elephant hunter or an archaeologist or a plant man or any of those things. All his deals were business deals, and they always turned out well. So he also, in his way, is conventional. Yes, that about covers it. I don't know what made him come back to England after his brother died. Possibly a new wife. He's married again. Good-looking woman, good deal younger than he is. At the moment they're living with old Sir Roderick Horsfield, whose sister had married Andrew Ristarick's uncle. But I imagine that's only temporary. Is any of this news to you, or do you know it already? I've heard most of it, said Poirot. Is there any insanity in the family on either side? Or oh, shouldn't think so, apart from old auntie and her fancy religions. And that's not unusual in a woman who lives alone. So all you can tell me really is that there is a lot of money, said Poirot. Lots of money, said Chief Inspector Neal, and all quite respectable. Some of it, mark you, Andrew Ristarick brought into the firm. South African concessions, mines, mineral deposits. I'd say that by the time these were developed or placed on the market, there'd be a very large sum of money indeed. And who will inherit it? said Poirot. Well, that depends on how Andrew Ristarick leaves it. It's up to him. But I'd say there's no one obvious except his wife and his daughter. So they both stand to inherit a very large amount of money one day. I should say so. I expect there are a good many family trusts and things like that, all the usual city gambits. There is, for instance, no other woman in whom he might be interested. Or nothing known of such a thing. I shouldn't think it likely. He's got a good-looking new wife. A young man, said Poirot thoughtfully, could easily learn all this. Or oh, you mean and marry the daughter? Well, there's nothing to stop him, even if she was made a ward of court or something like that. Of course, her father could then disinherit her if he wanted to. Poirot looked down at a neatly written list in his hand. What about the Weatherburn Gallery? I wondered how you'd got on to that. Were you consulted by a client about a forgery? Do they deal in forgeries? Well, people don't deal in forgeries, said Chief Inspector Neal reprovingly. There was a rather unpleasant business, a, a millionaire from Texas over here buying pictures and paying incredible sums for them. They sold him a Renoir and a Van Gogh. The Renoir was a small head of a girl, and there was some query about it. There seemed no reason to believe that the Wedderburn Gallery had not bought it in the first place in all good faith. Uh, there was a case about it. A great many art experts came and gave their verdicts. In fact, as usual, in the end, they all seemed to contradict each other. The gallery offered to take it back in any case— However, the millionaire didn't change his mind, since the latest fashionable expert swore that it was perfectly genuine, so he stuck to it. All the same, there's been a bit of suspicion hanging round the gallery ever since. Poirot looked again at his list. And what about Mr. David Baker? Have you looked him up for me? Oh, he's one of the usual mob, riffraff. Go about in gangs and break up nightclubs. Live on purple hearts, heroin, coke. Girls go mad about them. He's the kind they moan over, saying his life has been so hard, and he's such a wonderful genius. His painting is not appreciated, nothing but good old sex, if you ask me. Poirot consulted his list again. Do you know anything about Mr. Rhys Holland, MP? Doing quite well, politically. Got the gift of the gab, all right. One or two slightly peculiar transactions in the city, but he's wriggled out of them quite neatly. I'd say he was a slippery one. He's made quite a good deal of money— off and on, by rather doubtful means. Poirot came to his last point. What about Sir Roderick Horsfield? A nice old boy, but gaga. What a nose you have, Poirot. Get it into everything, don't you? Yes, there's been a lot of trouble in the special branch. It's this craze for memoirs. Nobody knows what indiscreet revelations are going to be made next. All the old boys, service and otherwise, are racing hard to bring out their own particular brand of what they remember of the indiscretions of others. Usually it doesn't much matter, but sometimes... Well, you know, cabinets change their policies, and you don't want to affront someone's susceptibilities or give the wrong publicity, so we have to try and muffle the old boys. Some of them are not too easy, but you'll have to go to the special branch if you want to nose into any of that. I shouldn't think there's much wrong. The trouble is, they don't destroy the papers they should. They keep the lot. However, 
I don't think there is much in that, but we have evidence that a certain power is nosing around. Poirot gave a deep sigh. Oh, haven't I helped? asked the chief inspector. I am very glad to get the real lowdown from official quarters, but uh, no, I don't think there is much help in what you have told me. He sighed and then said, What would be your opinion if someone said to you casually that a woman, a young, attractive woman, wore a wig? Well, nothing in that, said Chief Inspector Neal, and added, with a slight asperity, My wife wears a wig when we're travelling any time. It saves a lot of trouble. Oh, I beg your pardon, said Hercule Poirot. As the two men bade each other goodbye, the Chief Inspector asked, "'You got all the dope, I suppose, on that suicide case you were asking about in the flats? I had it sent round to you.' "'Yes, thank you. The official facts, at least, a bare record. There was something you were talking about just now that brought it back to my mind. I'll think of it in a moment. It was uh, the usual rather sad story. Gay woman, fond of men, enough money to live upon, no particular worries, drank too much, and went down the hill.' and then she gets what I call the health bug. You know, they're convinced they have cancer or something in that line. They consult a doctor, and he tells them they're all right, and they go home and don't believe him. If you ask me, it's usually because they find they're no longer as attractive as they used to be to men. That's what's really depressing them. Yes, it happens all the time. They're lonely, I suppose. Poor devils. Mrs. Charpentier was just one of them. I don't suppose that any— He stopped. Oh, yes— of course, I remember. You were asking about one of our MPs, Rhys Holland. He's a fairly gay one himself, in a discreet way. Anyway, Louise Charpentier was his mistress at one time. That's all. Was it a serious liaison? Oh, I shouldn't say so, particularly. They went to some rather questionable clubs together, and things like that. You know, we keep a discreet eye on things of that kind. But there was never anything in the press about them. Nothing of that kind. I see... But it lasted for a certain time. They were seen together off and on for about six months. But I don't think she was the only one, and I don't think he was the only one either. So you can't make anything of that, can you? I do not think so, said Poirot. But all the same, he said to himself as he went down the stairs, all the same, it is a link. It explains the embarrassment of Mr. Macfarlane. It is a link, a tiny link, between Emeline Rees Holland MP and Louise Charpentier. It didn't mean anything, probably. Why should it? But yet... Oh, I know too much, said Poirot angrily to himself. I know too much. I know a little about everything and everyone, but I cannot get my pattern. Half these facts are irrelevant. I want a pattern. A pattern. My kingdom for a pattern, he said aloud. I beg your pardon, sir, said the lift boy, turning a startled head. It is nothing, said Poirot. Poirot paused at the doorway of the Wedderburn Gallery to inspect a picture which depicted three aggressive-looking cows, with vastly elongated bodies, overshadowed by a colossal and complicated design of windmills. The two seemed to have nothing to do with each other, or the very curious purple colouring. "'Interesting, isn't it?' said a soft, purring voice. A middle-aged man, who at first sight seemed to have shown a smile which exhibited an almost excessive number of beautiful white teeth, was at his elbow. Such freshness! He had large, white, plump hands, which he waved as though he was using them in an arabesque. Clever exhibition, closed last week. Claude Raphael show, opened the day before yesterday. It's going to do well, very well indeed. Ah, said Poirot and was led through grey velvet curtains into a long room. Poirot made a few cautious, if doubtful, remarks. The plump man took him in hand in a practised manner. Here was someone, he obviously felt, who must not be frightened away. He was a very experienced man in the art of salesmanship. You felt at once that you were welcome to be in his gallery all day, if you liked, without making a purchase. Surely, solely looking at these delightful pictures, though when you entered the gallery you might not have thought they were delightful— but by the time you went out, you were convinced that delightful was exactly the word to describe them. After receiving some useful artistic instruction, and making a few of the amateur's stock remarks, such as, I rather like that one, Mr. Boscombe responded encouragingly by some such phrase as, Now that's very interesting that you should say that. It shows, if I may say so, great perspicacity. 
Of course, you know it isn't the ordinary reaction. Most people prefer something, well, shall I say slightly, obvious. I like that. He pointed to a blue and green striped effect, arranged in one corner of the canvas. But this, yes, you've spotted the quality of the thing. I'd say myself, of course it's only my personal opinion, that that's one of Raphael's masterpieces. Poirot and he looked together, with both their heads on one side, at an orange, lopsided diamond, with two human eyes depending from it, by what looked like a spidery thread. Pleasant relations established, and time obviously being infinite, Poirot remarked, "'I think uh, a Miss Frances Carey works for you, does she not?' "'Ah, yes, Frances. Clever girl, that. Very artistic, and very competent, too.' Uh, just come back from Portugal, where she's been arranging an art show for us. Very successful. Uh, quite a good artist herself. But not, I should say, really creative, if you understand me. Uh, she is better on the business side. I think she recognizes that herself. I understand that she is a good patron of the arts. Oh, yes. Uh, she's interested in les jeunes. Encourages talent. Uh, persuaded me to give a show for a little group of young artists last spring. It was quite successful. Uh, the press noticed it, all in a small way, you understand. Yes, she has her protégés. I am, you understand, somewhat old-fashioned. Some of these young men, vraiment. Poirot's hands went up. Ah, said Mr. Boscombe indulgently, oh, you mustn't go by their appearances. It's just a fashion, you know, beards and jeans or brocades and hair, just a passing phase. David, someone, said Poirot. I forget his last name. Miss Carey seemed to think highly of him. Sure you don't mean Peter Cardiff? He's her present protégé. Mind you, I'm not quite so sure about him as she is. He's really not so much avant-garde as he is, well, positively reactionary. Quite, quite burn drone sometimes. Still, one never knows. You do get these reactions. She acts as his model occasionally. Uh, David Baker, that was the name I was trying to remember, said Poirot. Uh, he is not bad, said Mr. Boscombe, without enthusiasm. Not much originality, in my opinion. He was one of the group of artists I mentioned, but he didn't make any particular impression. A good painter, mind, but not striking. Derivative. Poirot went home. Miss Lemon presented him with letters to sign and departed with them duly signed. George served him with an omelette au fine herbe, garnished, as you might say, with a discreetly sympathetic manner. After lunch, as Poirot was settling himself in his square-backed armchair with his coffee at his elbow, the telephone rang. A Mrs. Oliver, sir, said George, lifting the telephone and placing it at his elbow. Poirot picked up the receiver reluctantly. He did not want to talk to Mrs. Oliver. He felt that she would urge upon him something which he did not want to do. Monsieur Poirot? C'est moi. Well, what are you doing? What have you done? I am sitting in this chair, said Poirot. Thinking, he added. Is that all? said Mrs. Oliver. It is the important thing, said Poirot. Whether I shall have success in it or not, I do not know. But you must find that girl. She's probably been kidnapped. It would certainly seem so, said Poirot. And I have a letter here which came by the midday post from her father, urging me to come and see him and tell him what progress I have made. Well, what progress have you made? At the moment, said Poirot reluctantly, none. Really, Monsieur Poirot, you really must take a grip on yourself. You too. Well, what do you mean, me too? Urging me on. Well, why didn't you go down to that place in Chelsea, where I was hit on the head? And yet myself hit on the head also? I simply don't understand you, said Mrs. Oliver. I gave you a clue by finding the girl in the cafe. You said so. I know, I know. But what about that woman who threw herself out of the window? Haven't you got anything out of that? I have made inquiries, yes. Well? Nothing. The woman is one of many. They are attractive when young, they have affairs, they are passionate, they have still more affairs, they get less attractive, they are unhappy and drink too much, they think they have cancer or some fatal disease, and so at last, in despair and loneliness, they throw themselves out of a window. Well, you said her death was important, that it meant something. It ought to have done. Really? At a loss for further comment, Mrs. Oliver rang off. Poirot leant back in his armchair as far as he could lean back, since it was an upright armchair, 
waved to George to remove the coffee pot and also the telephone, and proceeded to reflect upon what he did or did not know. To clarify his thoughts, he spoke out loud. He recalled three philosophical questions. What do I know? What can I hope? What ought I to do? He was not sure that he got them in the right order, or indeed if they were quite the right questions, but he reflected upon them. "'Perhaps I am too old,' said Hercule Poirot, at the bottom depths of despair. "'What do I know?' Upon reflection, he thought that he knew too much. He laid that question aside for the moment. "'What can I hope?' "'Well, one could always hope. He could hope that those excellent brains of his, so much better than anybody else's, would come up sooner or later with an answer to a problem which he felt uneasily that he did not really understand.' What ought I to do? Well, that was very definite. What he ought to do was go and call upon Mr. Andrew Ristarik, who was obviously distraught about his daughter, and who would no doubt blame Poirot for not having by now delivered the daughter in person. Poirot could understand that, and sympathized with his point of view, but disliked having to present himself in such a very unfavorable light. The only other thing he could do was to telephone to a certain number and ask what developments there had been. But before he did that, he would go back to the question he had laid aside. What do I know? He knew that the Wedderburn Gallery was under suspicion. So far, it had kept on the right side of the law, but it would not hesitate at swindling ignorant millionaires by selling them dubious pictures. He recalled Mr. Boscombe with his plump white hands and his plentiful teeth, and decided that he did not like him. He was the kind of man who was almost certainly up to dirty work— though he would no doubt protect himself remarkably well. That was a fact that might come into use because it might connect up with David Baker. Then there was David Baker himself, the peacock. What did he know about him? He had met him, he had conversed with him, and he had formed certain opinions about him. He would do a crooked deal of any kind for money. He would marry a rich heiress for her money, and not for love. He might perhaps be bought off. Yes, he probably could be bought off. Andrew Rastarik certainly believed so, and he was probably right, unless he considered Andrew Rastarik, thinking more of the picture on the wall hanging above him than of the man himself. He remembered the strong features, the jutting out chin, the air of resolution, of decision. Then he thought of Mrs. Andrew Rastarik, deceased. The bitter lines of her mouth, perhaps he would go down to cross hedges again and look at that portrait, so as to see it more clearly because there might be a clue to Norma in that. Norma. No, he must not think of Norma yet. What else was there? There was Mary Rastarik, whom the girl Sonia said must have a lover because she went up to London so often. He considered that point, but he did not think that Sonia was right. He thought Mrs. Rastarik was much more likely to go to London in order to look at possible properties to buy. Luxury flats, houses in Mayfair— decorators, all the things that money in the metropolis could buy. Money. It seemed to him that all the points that had been passing through his mind came to this in the end. Money. The importance of money. There was a great deal of money in this case. Somehow, in some way that was not obvious, money counted. Money played its part. So far there had been nothing to justify his belief that the tragic death of Mrs. Charpentier had been the work of Norma. No sign of evidence, no motive, yet it seemed to him that there was an undeniable link. The girl had said that she might have committed a murder. A death had taken place only a day or two previously, a death that had occurred in the building where she lived. Surely it would be too much of a coincidence that that death should not be connected in any way. He thought again of the mysterious illness which had affected Mary Rastarik, an occurrence so simple as to be classic in its outline. A poison case, where the poisoner was, must be, one of the household. Had Mary Rastarik poisoned herself? Had her husband tried to poison her? Had the girl Sonia administered poison? Or had Norma been the culprit? Everything pointed, Hercule Poirot had to confess, to Norma, as being the logical person. Tout de même, said Poirot, since I cannot find anything, eh bien, then the logic falls out of the window. He sighed, 
rose to his feet and told George to fetch him a taxi. He must keep his appointment with Andrew Ristarek. Claudia Rees Holland was not in the office today. Instead, a middle-aged woman received Poirot. She said that Mr. Ristarek was waiting for him, and ushered him into Ristarek's room. Well? Ristarek hardly waited until he had come through the door. Well? What about my daughter? Poirot spread out his hands. As yet, nothing. <laughs> Look here, man. There must be something, some clue. A girl can't just disappear into thin air. Girls have done it before now, and will do it again. Did you understand that no expense was to be spared? None whatever. I, I, I can't go on like this. He seemed completely on edge by this time. He looked thinner, and his red-rimmed eyes spoke of sleepless nights. I know what your anxiety must be, but I assure you that I have done everything possible to trace her. These things, alas, cannot be hurried. <laughs> she may have lost her memory, or she may... I mean, she might be sick, ill. Poirot thought he knew what the broken form of the sentence meant. Rasteric had been about to say, she may perhaps be dead. He sat down on the other side of the desk and said, Believe me, I appreciate your anxiety, and I have to say to you once again that the results would be a lot quicker if you consulted the police. No. The word broke out explosively. But they have greater facilities, more lines of inquiry. I assure you, it is not only a question of money. Money cannot give you the same result as a highly efficient organization can do. And it's no use your talking in that soothing way. Norma is my daughter, my only daughter, the only flesh and blood I've got. Are you sure that you have told me everything, everything possible about your daughter? Well, what more can I tell you? That is for you to say, not me. Have there been, for instance, any incidents in the past? Or such as? What do you mean, man? Any definite history of mental instability? You think that... that... How do I know? <laughs> how can I know? And how do I know? said Rysteric, suddenly bitter. What do I know of her? All these years. Grace was a bitter woman. A woman who did not easily forgive or forget. Sometimes I feel... I feel that she was the wrong person to have brought Norma up. He got up, walked up and down the room, and then sat down again. Of course I shouldn't have left my wife. I know that. I left her to bring up the child. But then at the time I suppose I made excuses for myself. Grace was a woman of excellent character, devoted to Norma, a thoroughly good guardian for her, but was she? Was she really? Some of the letters Grace wrote to me were as though they breathed anger and revenge. Well, I suppose that's natural enough. But I was away all those years. I should have come back come back more often and found out how the child was getting on. I suppose I had a bad conscience. Oh, it's no good making excuses now. He turned his head sharply. Yes, I did think when I saw her again that Norma's whole attitude was neurotic, indisciplined. I hoped she and Mary would, would get on better after a while. But I have to admit that I don't feel the girl was entirely normal. I felt it would be better for her to have a job in London and come home for weekends— but not to be forced into Mary's company the whole time. Oh, I suppose I made a mess of everything. But where is she, Monsieur Poirot? Where is she? Do you think she may have lost her memory? One hears of such things. Yes, said Poirot, that is a possibility. In her state she may be wandering about, quite unaware of who she is, or she may have had an accident. That is less likely. I can assure you that I have made all inquiries in hospitals and other places. Well, you don't think she is... You don't think she is dead? She would be easier to find dead than alive, I can assure you. Please calm yourself, Mr. Restaric. Remember, she may have friends of whom you know nothing, friends in any part of England, friends whom she has known while living with her mother or with her aunt, or friends who were friends of school friends of hers. All these things take time to sort out. It may be, you must prepare yourself, that she is with a boyfriend of some kind. David Baker? If I thought that, she is not with David Baker. That, said Poirot dryly, I ascertained first of all. How do I know what friends she has? He sighed. If I find her, when I find her, I'd rather put it that way, I'm going to take her out of all this. Out of all what? Out of this country. 
"'I've been miserable, Monsieur Poirot, miserable ever since I returned here. I always hated city life, the boring round of office routine, continual consultations with lawyers and financiers. The life I liked was always the same. Travelling, moving about from place to place, going to wild and inaccessible places, that's the life for me. I should never have left it. I should have sent for Norma to come out to me. And as I say, when I find her, that's what I'm going to do. Already I'm being approached with various takeover bids. Well, they can have the whole caboodle on very advantageous terms. I'll take the cash and go back to a country that means something, that's real. Aha! And what will your wife say to that? Mary? Oh, she's used to that life. That's where she comes from. To les femmes, with plenty of money, said Poirot, London can be very attractive. She'll see it my way. The telephone rang on his desk. He picked it up. Yes? Oh, from Manchester. Yes, if it's Claudia Rees Holland, put her through. He waited a minute. Hello, Claudia. Yes, uh, speak up. It's a very bad line. I can't hear you. They agreed. Ah, pity. No, I think you did very well. Right. All right, then. Take the evening train back. We'll discuss it further tomorrow morning. He replaced the telephone on its rest. That's a competent girl, he said. Miss Rees Holland? Yes, unusually competent. Takes a lot of bother off my shoulders. I gave her pretty well carte blanche to put through this deal in Manchester on her own terms. I really felt I couldn't concentrate, and she's done exceedingly well. She's as good as a man in some ways. He looked at Poirot, suddenly bringing himself back to the present. Ah, yes, Monsieur Poirot. Well, uh, I'm afraid uh, I've rather lost my grip. Do you need more money for expenses? No, monsieur. I assure you that I will do my utmost to restore your daughter sound and well. I have taken all possible precautions for her safety. He went out through the outer office. When he reached the street, he looked up at the sky. A definite answer to one question, he said. That is what I need. Hercule Poirot looked up at the façade of the dignified Georgian house in what had been until recently a quiet street in an old-fashioned market town. Progress was rapidly overtaking it, but the new supermarket, the gift shop, Marjorie's boutique, Peg's cafe, and a palatial new bank had all chosen sites in Croft Road, and not encroached on the narrow high street. The brass knocker on the door was brightly polished, Poirot noted with approval. He pressed the bell at the side. It was opened almost at once by a tall, distinguished-looking woman with upswept grey hair and an energetic manner. Monsieur Poirot, you're very punctual. Come in. Miss Battersby? Certainly. She held back the door. Poirot entered. She deposited his hat on the hall stand and led the way to a pleasant room overlooking a narrow, walled garden. She waved towards a chair and sat down herself in an attitude of expectation. It was clear that Miss Battersby was not one to lose time in conventional utterances. "'You are, I think, the former principal of Meadowfield School.' "'Yes. I retired a year ago. I understand you wished to see me on the subject of Norma Resteric, a former pupil. That is right. In your letters,' said Miss Battersby, "'you gave me no further details.' She added, "'I may say that I know who you are, Monsieur Poirot.' I should therefore like a little more information before I proceed further. Are you, for instance, thinking of employing Norma Risteric? That is not my intention, no. And knowing what your profession is, you understand why I should want further details. Have you, for instance, an introduction to me from any of Norma's relations? Again, no, said Hercule Poirot. I will explain myself further. Thank you. In actual fact, I am employed by Miss Risteric's father, Andrew Risteric. Ah! He has recently returned to England, I believe, after many years' absence. That is so. But you do not bring me a letter of introduction from him. I did not ask him for one. Miss Battersby looked at him inquiringly. He might have insisted on coming with me, said Hercule Poirot. That would have hampered me in asking you the questions that I wish to ask, because it is likely that the answers to them might cause him pain and distress. There is no reason why he should be caused further distress than he is already suffering at this moment. Has anything happened to Norma? I hope not. Uh, there is, however, a possibility of that. You remember the girl, Miss Battersby? I remember all my pupils. I have an excellent memory. Meadowfield, in any case, is not a very large school. Two hundred girls, no more. Why have you resigned from it, Miss Battersby? Really, Monsieur Poirot? 
I cannot see that that is any of your business. Oh, no, I am merely expressing my quite natural curiosity. I am seventy. Is that not a reason? Oh, not in your case, I should say. You appear to me to be in full vigour and energy, fully capable of continuing your headmistressship for a good many years to come. Times change, Monsieur Poirot. One does not always like the way they are changing. I will satisfy your curiosity. I found I was having less and less patience with parents. Their aims for their daughters are short-sighted and, quite frankly, stupid. Miss Battersby was, as Poirot knew from looking up her qualifications, a very well-known mathematician. Do not think I lead an idle life, said Miss Battersby. I lead a life where the work is far more congenial to me. I coach senior students. And now, please, may I know the reason for your interest in the girl Norma Ristarik? There is some occasion for anxiety. She has, to put it boldly, disappeared. Miss Battersby continued to look quite unconcerned. Indeed, when you say disappeared, I presume you mean that she has left home without telling her parents where she was going. Oh, I believe her mother is dead, so without telling her father where she was going. That is really not at all uncommon nowadays, Monsieur Poirot. Mr. Rysteric has not consulted the police. He is adamant on that subject. He refuses definitely. I can assure you that I have no knowledge as to where the girl is. I have heard nothing from her. Indeed, I have had no news from her since she left Meadowfield, so I fear I cannot help you in any way. It is not precisely that kind of information that I want. I want to know what kind of a girl she is. How would you describe her? Not her personal appearance, I do not mean that. I mean as to her personality and characteristics. Norma at school was a perfectly ordinary girl. Not scholastically brilliant, but her work was adequate. Not a neurotic type? Miss Battersby considered. Then she said slowly, No, I would not say so. Not more, that is, than might be expected, considering her home circumstances. You mean her invalid mother? Yes, she came from a broken home. The father, to whom I think she was very devoted, left home suddenly with another woman, a fact which her mother quite naturally resented. She probably upset her daughter more than she need have done by voicing her resentment without restraint. Perhaps it may be more to the point if I ask you your opinion of the late Mrs. Rysteric. What you are asking for is my private opinion. If you do not object. No, I have no hesitation at all in answering your question. Home conditions are very important in a girl's life, and I have always studied them as much as I can through the meagre information that comes to me. Mrs. Rysteric was a worthy and upright woman, I should say, self-righteous, censorious, and handicapped in life by being an extremely stupid one. Ah, said Poirot appreciatively. She was also, I would say, a malade imaginaire, a type that would exaggerate her ailments, the type of woman who is always in and out of nursing homes. An unfortunate home background for a girl, especially a girl who has no very definite personality of her own. Norma had no marked intellectual ambitions. She had no confidence in herself. She was not a girl to whom I would recommend a career. A nice ordinary job, followed by marriage and children, was what I would have hoped for her. You saw, forgive me for asking, no signs at any time of mental instability. Mental instability? said Miss Battersby. Rubbish. So, that is what you say. Rubbish. And not neurotic. Any girl, or almost any girl, can be neurotic, especially in adolescence, and in her first encounters with the world. She is still immature, and needs guidance in her first encounters with sex. Girls are frequently attracted to completely unsuitable and sometimes even dangerous young men. There are, it seems, no parents nowadays, or hardly any, with the strength of character to save them from this, so they often go through a time of hysterical misery, and perhaps make an unsuitable marriage which ends, not long after, in divorce. But Norma showed no signs of mental instability, Poirot persisted with the question. She is an emotional but normal girl, said Miss Battersby. Mental instability. As I said before, rubbish. She's probably run away with some young man to get married, and there's nothing more normal than that. Poirot sat in his big square armchair. His hands rested on the arms. His eyes looked at the chimney-piece in front of him without seeing it. By his elbow was a small table, and on it, neatly clipped together, were various documents. Reports from Mr. Gobi, information obtained from his friend Chief Inspector Neal, a series of separate pages under the heading of Hearsay, Gossip, Rumour. 
and the sources from which it had been obtained. At the moment he had no need to consult these documents. He had, in fact, read them through carefully and laid them there in case there was any particular point he wished to refer to once more. He wanted now to assemble together in his mind all that he knew and had learned, because he was convinced that these things must form a pattern. There must be a pattern there. He was considering now from what exact angle to approach it. He was not one to trust in enthusiasm for some particular intuition. He was not an intuitive person, but he did have feelings. The important thing was, not the feelings themselves, but what might have caused them. It was the cause that was interesting. The cause was so often not what you thought it was. You had very often to work it out by logic, by sense, and by knowledge. What did he feel about this case? What kind of a case was it? Let him start from the general, then proceed to the particular. What were the salient facts of this case? Money was one of them, he thought, though he did not know how. Somehow or other money. He also thought, increasingly, that there was evil somewhere. He knew evil. He had met it before. He knew the tang of it, the taste of it, the way it went. The trouble was that here he did not yet know exactly where it was. He had taken certain steps to combat evil. He hoped they would be sufficient. Something was happening, something was in progress, that was not yet accomplished. Someone, somewhere, was in danger. The trouble was that the facts pointed both ways. If the person he thought was in danger was really in danger, there seemed, so far as he could see, no reason why. Why should that particular person be in danger? There was no motive. If the person he thought was in danger was not in danger, then the whole approach might have to be completely reversed. Everything that pointed one way he must turn round and look at from the complete opposite point of view. He left that for the moment in the balance, and he came from there to the personalities, to the people. What pattern did they make? What part were they playing? First, Andrew Rysterik. He had accumulated by now a fair amount of information about Andrew Rysterik, a general picture of his life before and after going abroad. A restless man, never sticking to one place or purpose long, but generally liked. Nothing of the wastrel about him, nothing shoddy or tricky, not perhaps a strong personality. Weak in many ways? Poirot frowned, dissatisfied. That picture did not somehow fit the Andrew Rysterik that he himself had met, not weak, surely, with that thrust-out chin, the steady eyes, the air of resolution. He had been a successful businessman, too, apparently, good at his job in the earlier years, and he had put through good deals in South Africa and in South America. He had increased his holdings. It was a success story that he had brought home with him, not one of failure. How, then, could he be a weak personality? Weak, perhaps, only where women were concerned. He had made a mistake in his marriage, married the wrong woman, pushed into it perhaps by his family. And then he had met the other woman. Just that one woman? Or had there been several women? It was hard to find a record of that kind after so many years. Certainly he had not been a notoriously unfaithful husband. He had had a normal home. He had been fond, by all accounts, of his small daughter. But then he had come across a woman whom he had cared for enough to leave his home and leave his country. It had been a real love affair. But had it, perhaps, matched up with any additional motive? Dislike of office work, the city, the daily routine of London? He thought it might. It matched the pattern. He seemed, too, to have been a solitary type. Everyone had liked him, both here and abroad, but there seemed no intimate friends. Indeed, it would have been difficult for him to have intimate friends abroad, because he had never stopped in any one spot long enough. He had plunged into some gamble, attempted a coup— had made good, then tired of the whole thing and gone on somewhere else, nomadic, a wanderer. It still did not quite accord with his own picture of the man. A picture. The word stirred in his mind the memory of the picture that hung in Rastarek's office on the wall behind his desk. It had been a portrait of the same man fifteen years ago. How much difference had those fifteen years made in the man sitting there? Surprisingly little on the whole, more grey in the hair— a heavier set to the shoulders, but the lines of character on the face were much the same. A determined face, a man who knew what he wanted, who meant to get it, a man who would take risks, a man with a certain ruthlessness. 
Why, he wondered, had Ristaric brought that picture up to London? They had been companion portraits of a husband and wife. Strictly speaking, artistically, they should have remained together. Would a psychologist have said that subconsciously Ristaric wanted to dissociate himself from his former wife once more, to separate himself from her? Was he then mentally still retreating from her personality, although she was dead? An interesting point. The pictures had presumably come out of storage with various other family articles of furnishing. Mary Ristaric had no doubt selected certain personal objects to supplement the furniture of cross hedges for which Sir Roderick had made room. He wondered whether Mary Ristaric, the new wife, had liked hanging up that particular pair of portraits. More natural, perhaps, if she had put the first wife's portrait in an attic. But then he reflected that she would probably not have had an attic to stow away unwanted objects at cross hedges. Presumably Sir Roderick had made room for a few family things whilst the returned couple were looking about for a suitable house in London, so it had not mattered much, and it would have been easier to hang both portraits. Besides, Mary Rostaric seemed a sensible type of woman, not a jealous or emotional type. Tout mem, thought Hercule Poirot to himself, les femmes. They are all capable of jealousy, and sometimes the one you would consider the least likely. His thoughts passed to Mary Rostaric, and he considered her in turn. It struck him that what was really odd was that he had so few thoughts about her. He had seen her only the once, and she had somehow or other not made much impression on him. A certain efficiency, he thought, and also a certain—how could he put it?—artificiality. But there, my friend, said Hercule Poirot again in parenthesis, there you are considering her wig. It was absurd, really, that one should know so little about a woman— a woman who was efficient, and who wore a wig, and who was good-looking, and who was sensible, and who could feel anger. Yes, she had been angry when she had found the peacock boy wandering uninvited in her house. She had displayed it sharply and unmistakably. And the boy? He had seemed what? Amused, no more. But she had been angry, very angry at finding him there. Well, that was natural enough. He would not be any mother's choice for her daughter. Poirot stopped short in his thoughts, shaking his head vexedly. Mary Rostaric was not Norma's mother, not for her the agony, the apprehension about a daughter making an unsuitable, unhappy marriage, or announcing an illegitimate baby with an unsuitable father. What did Mary feel about Norma? Presumably, to begin with, that she was a thoroughly tiresome girl who had picked up with a young man who was going to be obviously a source of worry and annoyance to Andrew Rostaric. But after that— what had she thought and felt about a stepdaughter who was apparently deliberately trying to poison her? Her attitude seemed to have been the sensible one. She had wanted to get Norma out of the house, herself out of danger, and to cooperate with her husband in suppressing any scandal about what had happened. Norma came down for an occasional weekend to keep up appearances, but her life henceforward was bound to centre in London. Even when the Rostarics moved into the house they were looking for, they would not suggest Norma living with them. Most girls nowadays lived away from their families, so that problem had been settled. Except that, for Poirot, the question of who had administered poison to Mary Rostaric was very far from settled. Rostaric himself believed it was his daughter. But Poirot wondered. His mind played with the possibilities of the girl Sonia. What was she doing in that house? Why had she come there? She had Sir Roderick eating out of her hand all right. Perhaps she had no wish to go back to her own country. Possibly her designs were purely matrimonial. Old men of Sir Roderick's age married pretty young girls every day of the week. In the worldly sense, Sonia could do very well for herself. A secure social position, and widowhood to look forward to with a settled and sufficient income. Or were her aims quite different? Had she gone to Kew Gardens with Sir Roderick's missing papers tucked between the pages of a book? Had Mary Rostaric become suspicious of her, of her activities, of her loyalties, of where she went on her days off, and of whom she met? And had Sonia then administered the substances which, in cumulative small doses, would arouse no suspicion of anything but ordinary gastroenteritis? For the time being, he put the household at cross hedges out of his mind. He came, as Norma had come, to London, and proceeded to the consideration of three girls who shared a flat. Claudia Rees Holland Francis Carey, Norma Rostaric. Claudia Rees Holland, daughter of a well-known member of Parliament, well-off, capable, well-trained, good-looking, a first-class secretary. Francis Carey, 
a country solicitor's daughter. Artistic, had been to drama school for a short time, then to the Slade. Chuck that also. Occasionally worked for the Arts Council, now employed by an art gallery. Earned a good salary. Was artistic, and had bohemian associations. She knew the young man David Baker, though not apparently more than casually. Perhaps she was in love with him. He was the kind of young man, Poirot thought, disliked generally by parents, members of the establishment, and also the police. Where the attraction lay for well-born girls, Poirot failed to see, but one had to acknowledge it as a fact. What did he himself think of David? A good-looking boy, with the impudent and slightly amused air, whom he had first seen in the upper stories of Cross Hedges, doing an errand for Norma, or reconnoitering on his own, who should say? He had seen him again when he gave him a lift in his car. A young man of personality, giving indeed an impression of ability in what he chose to do. And yet there was clearly an unsatisfactory side to him. Poirot picked up one of the papers on the table by his side and studied it. A bad record, though not positively criminal. Small frauds on garages, hooliganism, smashing things up, on probation twice. All those things were the fashion of the day. They did not come under Poirot's category of evil. He had been a promising painter, but had chucked it. He was the kind that did no steady work. He was vain, proud, a peacock, in love with his own appearance. Was he anything more than that? Poirot wondered. He stretched out an arm and picked up a sheet of paper on which was scribbled down the rough heads of the conversation held between Norma and David in the café, that is, as well as Mrs. Oliver could remember them. And how well was that, Poirot thought. He shook his head doubtfully. One never knew quite at what point Mrs. Oliver's imagination would take over. Did the boy care for Norma? Really want to marry her? There was no doubt about her feelings for him. He had suggested marrying her. Had Norma got money of her own? She was the daughter of a rich man, but that was not the same thing. Poirot made an exclamation of vexation. He had forgotten to inquire the terms of the late Mrs. Ristarek's will. He flipped through the sheets of notes. No, Mr. Gobi had not neglected this obvious need. Mrs. Ristarek apparently had been well provided for by her husband during her lifetime. She had had apparently a small income of her own, amounting perhaps to a thousand a year. She had left everything she possessed to her daughter. It would hardly amount, Poirot thought, to a motive for marriage. Probably, as his only child, she would inherit a lot of money at her father's death, but that was not at all the same thing. Her father might leave her very little indeed, if he disliked the man she had married. He would say then that David did care for her, since he was willing to marry her, and yet Poirot shook his head. It was about the fifth time he had shaken it. All these things did not tie up. They did not make a satisfactory pattern. He remembered Rastarek's desk and the cheque he had been writing, apparently to buy off the young man, and the young man apparently was quite willing to be bought off. So that again did not tally. The cheque had certainly been made out to David Baker, and it was for a very large, really a preposterous sum. It was a sum that might have tempted any impecunious young man of bad character, and yet he had suggested marriage to her only a day before. That, of course, might have been just a move in the game, a move to raise the price he was asking. Poirot remembered Rastarek sitting there, his lips hard. He must care a great deal for his daughter, to be willing to pay so high a sum, and he must have been afraid, too, that the girl herself was quite determined to marry him. From thoughts of Rastarek, he went on to Claudia, Claudia and Andrew Rastarek. Was it chance, sheer chance, that she had come to be his secretary? There might be a link between them. Claudia. He considered her. Three girls in a flat. Claudia Rees Holland's flat. She had been the one who had taken the flat originally, and shared it first with a friend, a girl she already knew, and then with another girl. The third girl. The third girl, thought Poirot. Yes, it always came back to that. The third girl. And that is where he had come in the end. To Norma Ristarek. A girl who had come to consult him as he sat at breakfast. A girl whom he had joined at a table in a cafe, where she had recently been eating baked beans with the young man she loved. He always seemed to see her at mealtimes, he noted. And what did he think about her? First, what did other people think about her? Ristarek cared for her, and was desperately anxious about her, desperately frightened for her. He not only suspected, he was quite sure, apparently, that she had tried to poison his recently married wife— he had consulted a doctor about her. Poirot felt 
He would like dearly to talk to that doctor himself, but he doubted if he would get anywhere. Doctors were very chary of parting with medical information to anyone but a duly accredited person such as the parents. But Poirot could imagine fairly well what the doctor had said. He had been cautious, Poirot thought, as doctors are apt to be. He'd hemmed and hawed, and spoken perhaps of medical treatment. He had not stressed too positively a mental angle, but had certainly suggested it, or hinted at it. In fact, the doctor probably was privately sure that that was what had happened. But he also knew a good deal about hysterical girls, and that they sometimes did things that were not really the result of mental causes, but merely of temper, jealousy, emotion, and hysteria. He would not be a psychiatrist himself, nor a neurologist. He would be a GP, who took no risks of making accusations about which he could not be sure, but suggested certain things out of caution. A job somewhere or other. A job in London. Later, perhaps, treatment from a specialist. What did anyone else think of Norma Rostarek? Claudia Rees Holland? He didn't know. Certainly not from the little that he knew about her. She was capable of hiding any secret. She would certainly let nothing escape her which she did not mean to let escape. She had shown no signs of wanting to turn the girl out, which she might have done if she had been afraid of her mental condition. There could not have been much discussion between her and Francis on the subject, since the other girl had so innocently let escape the fact that Norma had not returned to them after her weekend at home. Was Ophelia mad or sane? Rysteric would not have used the word mad even in his thoughts about his daughter. Mentally disturbed was the term that everyone preferred to use. The other word that had been used of Norma had been batty. She's a bit batty. Not quite all there. A bit wanting, if you know what I mean. Were daily women good judges? Poirot thought they might be. There was something odd about Norma, certainly, but she might be odd in a different way to what she seemed. He remembered the picture she had made slouching into his room, a girl of today, the modern type, looking just as so many other girls looked, limp hair hanging on her shoulders, the characterless dress, a skimpy look about the knees, all to his old-fashioned eyes, looking like an adult girl pretending to be a child. "'I'm sorry, you are too old.' Perhaps it was true. He'd looked at her through the eyes of someone old, without admiration, to him just a girl without apparently will to please, without coquetry, a girl without any sense of her own femininity, no charm or mystery or enticement, who had nothing to offer, perhaps, but plain biological sex. So it may be that she was right in her condemnation of him. He could not help her, because he did not understand her, because it was not even possible for him to appreciate her. He had done his best for her. But what had that meant up to date? What had he done for her since that one moment of appeal? And in his thoughts the answer came quickly. He had kept her safe, that at least. If indeed she needed keeping safe, that was where the whole point lay. Did she need keeping safe? That preposterous confession. Really, not so much a confession as an announcement. I think I may have committed a murder. Hold on to that, because that was the crux of the whole thing. That was his métier, to deal with murder, to clear up murder, to prevent murder, to be the good dog who hunts down murder, murder announced, murder somewhere. He had looked for it, and he had not found it. The pattern of arsenic in the soup, a pattern of young hooligans stabbing each other with knives, the ridiculous and sinister phrase, bloodstains in the courtyard, a shot fired from a revolver, at whom? And why? It was not as it ought to be. A form of crime that would fit with the words she had said, I may have committed a murder. He had stumbled on in the dark, trying to see a pattern of crime, trying to see where the third girl fitted into that pattern, and coming back always to the same urgent need to know what this girl was really like. And then, with a casual phrase, Ariadne Oliver had, as he thought, shown him the light. The supposed suicide of a woman at Borodine Mansions. That would fit. It was where the third girl had her living quarters. It must be the murder that she had meant. Another murder committed about the same time would have been too much of a coincidence. Besides, there was no sign or trace of any other murder that had been committed about then, no other death that could have sent her hot foot to consult him, after listening at a party to the lavish admiration of his own achievements which his friend, Mrs. Oliver, had given to the world. And so, when Mrs. Oliver had informed him in a casual manner of the woman who had thrown herself out of the window, it had seemed to him that at last he had got what he had been looking for. Here was the clue, the answer to his perplexity. Here he would find what he needed, the why, the when, the where.
End of disc five. 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 End of 